Thank you very much for the invitation. So I would like to talk about the joint work with Hu Yu about the three membranes problem, which is uh, <clears throat> a vector valued version of the obstacle problem. So uh, <clears throat> I'll start introducing the problem. First of all, <clears throat> we'll talk about uh, the model for an elastic membrane. So <clears throat> we think uh, of a membrane as a graph of a function u. So uh, its points are x, u of x, and rn plus one. And we think that the membrane has to minimize the surface uh, tension. Therefore, it has to minimize the area. Yeah? So the model, the, a, a physical model for the elastic membrane would be to minimize the <coughs> area square root of one plus gradient of u squared among all functions that are fixed on the boundary. So we think that uh, the, the boundary phi is given. However, in order to simplify the model, we uh, make it linear and we think that we are in the regime of small gradients and we approximate square root of one plus gradient of u squared with uh, just one plus one half gradient of u squared. And then, and then of course the simplified model would be that we wanna minimize the Dirichlet energy of the, of the graph of u. So basically harmonic functions would be a simplified model, a linearized model to describe the shape of an elastic membrane. And then one of the simplest variational inequalities uh, is known as the obstacle problem. And we think we are given some obstacle P here, like with the green uh, drawn in green is given, the boundary data phi is given on, on the boundary of the domain. And then we wanna minimize, we wanna look at, find the elastic membrane stretch across the obstacle P. This is the obstacle problem. And uh, let's say, I mean, what, what we expect, we expect the solution to be continuous. And then in the set where you would strictly separate from the obstacle, it would be harmonic because we can perturb you on both uh, sides. On the other hand, uh, globally, we cannot perturb you on both sides, but only upwards. So we also obtain some sort of global information. We have like a, an, an information on the set where you separate from the obstacle that you is harmonic, but also global information that you has to be super harmonic at all the points. So often the obstacle problem is considered uh, with, with zero obstacle. In other words, in, in, instead of working with u and p, we subtract, we work with u minus p, then the obstacle becomes zero. And the equivalent formulation is that we want to minimize among functions that are prescribed on the boundary of omega, but are non negative. The energy is one half gradient of u squared plus fu which means that the force is acting on the membrane. So we can try to think physically that maybe the membrane, like the gravity acts on the membrane has a weight and then is going to sit on top of a table and at some point is going to touch the table. This means this is the region where U is zero and at some points you separate from the table. So then again, like we know that Laplace of U will be F in the set where u is strictly positive and globally we know that Laplace of u is less than or equal to f. Globally, these two things can be written more compactly into this, uh, into Laplace of u is f uh, times the characteristic function or u equal to zero. So, so the Laplace essentially has no distributional derivative on, on the boundary of the set where u is zero. This sort of formulation here suggests that there are no, uh, that, that the function u um, touches zero at, at uh, zero angle with zero derivative. Okay, so this is the obstacle problem. Now another version of the, of the obstacle problem is known as a two membranes problem in which we have two membranes 
you want both of them elastic, right? Instead of instead of it being rigid, we think that we have another elastic membranes underneath, and we think that one membrane here, uh, represented in blue, is pushed down, and the red membrane is pushed up. And again, we expect some contact region between the two membranes and some some region where the two membranes are separated. Like mathematically, you say you want to minimize the sum of the energies of the two membranes. And the constraint, of course, is that U1 is greater or equal than U2, that membranes cannot penetrate. Yeah? And the membranes are fixed on the boundary. And it turns out that this problem is actually, actually equivalent to the, to the obstacle problem with the rigid obstacle. And the reason for that is, is the following. Of course, the Euler-Lagrange equation, again, Laplace of U1 would be equal to F1 and Laplace of U2 is equal to F2 in the set where U1 is strictly bigger than U2. Globally, you can say still that U1, you can always perturb it upwards without messing up the constraint and U2 downwards without messing the constraint. So you get some inequalities globally, meaning the Laplace of U1 is less than F1 and Laplace of U2 is bigger than F2 globally. On the other hand, there is one extra, since, since both U1 and U2 are flexible, you can perturb them by the same perturbation without changing the constraint. Yeah, so if, if you look for the Euler-Lagrange equation, but you perturb U1 by an arbitrary function and U2 by the same arbitrary function, you look at the Euler-Lagrange equation and one realizes that U1 plus U2 in fact solves an equation, which is the right hand side is F1 plus F2. So this means if the picture is like on the right, in the coincidence region, U1 is equal to U2. So actually in the coincidence region, Laplace of U1 is the same as Laplace of U2 and is equal to the average of F1 plus of the average of the forces, F1 plus F2. So why is this equivalent to the obstacle problem? So I, I here on the bottom picture, we know U1, U1 plus U2 is, the term, is determined simply from the boundary data by solving a Laplace equation. So the average, the average of U1 and U2 is sort of determined clearly from the problem. And then you can try to think of this average being the actual obstacle for F1. Yeah. So in the set where F1 touches this obstacle, this means that also F2 touches the obstacle there. But when F1 separate, when, when the blue line separates from the green line, then, um, then U1 is unconstrained. It's of the plus of U1 equal to F1. Yeah? So, so the two membranes problem is in some sense equivalent to the obstacle problem. I mean, the formulation like this is uninteresting because you can always go back to, to the obstacle problem with, with fixed obstacle. However, let, let me just mention some other variants of the two membranes problem that uh, are, are more interesting. One was considered by Luis Silvestri in which you, instead of doing the Dirichlet energy, you do like a nonlinear operator, like, uh, like we started with, let's say the, the surface area. And then uh, it is not so clear that the difference between U1 and U2 solves an obstacle problem uh, in, in this case, because the equations are no longer linear. Um, however, since you want to solve the same equation, one, one can still uh, fit it in the same flavor of an obstacle problem for the difference you want to do. Another variant of the two membranes problem was, was considered, we considered in a paper with Caffarelli and uh, Daniela. Uh, in which we, we made like some sort of version in which one, one is an elastic membrane, but the other one is an elastic string represented by the red line. So this is like some, some version between the obstacle problem and the thin obstacle problem, right? It would be like thin obstacle, but the, the, the thin obstacle is elastic as well. So we, we, we investigated this problem uh, like two or three years ago. 
However, uh, an open problem that we, we couldn't make uh, much progress on it would be like the case of different second order linear operators. So, so I think a difficult uh, free boundary problem involving two membranes would be to really minimize the energy of uh, the, the Dirichlet energy in some sense of, of two membranes, U1 and U2, but the, the coefficients, the uh, the, the two membranes should have different properties, like they, they are encoded in two matrices A1 and A2 with A1 different than A2, symmetric matrices. Yeah? So in this case, the two operators are completely different and they have the same order and we cannot, we, we, we don't know how to do, the, let's say, optimal regularity or, or regularity of the free boundary which are the standard questions in some problems. Okay, so this would be the two membranes problem, which, which we said is equivalent to the obstacle problem. Now the N membranes problem was considered by Chipot and Vergara Caffarelli in the eighties, in which you consider not two membranes, but N, N membranes uh, ordered one on top of the other. So, we, we think here that U1 is the top membrane and then you have U2 and so on up to U capital N, the boundary data are given. And then we want to minimize the energy given by the sum of, of, the, of the energies of all the membranes. Yeah? And then similarly with, with the analysis that we did in the two membrane, if, you, if one tries to look at the, at the Euler-Lagrange equation, uh, you get that in a region where, let's say, M membranes coincide. I think here, if UK plus one is equal to UK plus two is equal to UK plus M, but the, the first UK plus one is completely separated from UK in a region and UK plus M is separated from UK K plus M plus one. Then in this region, the Laplace of all this uh, of all these membranes that coincide should be given by the average of the of the corresponding forces. Yeah. And like, like we have here a picture on the right in which there are three membranes, U1 with, uh, with uh, blue, U2 with green and U3 with red. And we think that like some force is acting on U1, let's say from the top, some force is pushing U2 U3 from the bottom and, and U2 is sandwiched between them. And you can see that there are certain regions like where membranes might coincide and some regions where all the, all the membranes might coincide. Yeah? And in this case, there are like uh, N minus one free boundaries and we think of the free boundaries being the, the, the boundaries of, of the regions where consecutive membranes separate from each other. Yeah, so we have here, like in, in this one dimensional picture, if we look at the free boundary between U1 and U2 would correspond just of two points, which would be the point X1 and the point X3. Yeah, this is the, this is the these are the places where U1 separates from U2. While the, the other free boundary, if I look at the separation region between U2 and U3, I would get the X2 and X4 would be the second free boundary uh, between the green line and the red line. Yeah? Um, however, this can no longer be reduced to just the obstacle problem. If you look at the difference between two consecutive uh, membranes, for example, if you look at the difference between U1 and U2, and I look on, on the line from X3 to infinity, from X3 to, to the end point, then the, the second membrane U2 has a jump on the right hand side. It has a jump because in some region it coincides with the bottom membrane and some other region is free. Therefore, the difference between U1 and U2 has a jump on the right hand side depending on the third membrane. So it cannot, I mean, it, it's, it's going to be discontinuous. And this means that of course, well, what we deal here is a couple system of n minus one obstacle problems. So this would, 
in, in my view, this is like the, the version of uh, the vector valued version of the obstacle problem in which you have n minus one free boundaries, but they are interacting with each other. When you move U3, when you move the boundary data of U3, you affect U2 that moves also U1 and all the free boundaries are, are moving around. Okay, so just to, sorry, just to a drawing to understand what are the possible values of Laplace of U1. So here I'm drawing a 2D picture and here gamma one and gamma two represent the two free boundaries. Gamma one where the top u1 equals to u2 so u1 is bigger than u2 on top of the of the blue line and u1 equals to u2 on the bottom of the blue line and u2 is bigger than u3 on top of the green line and they are equal on the bottom of that yeah so in, somehow you, you get all these regions between be, the two free boundaries gamma one and gamma two give a lot of regions and the right hand side let's say of Laplace of U1 it, or, or U2 and U3 jumps when you go from region to region. So, so on the other hand, locally, in, at, the, at most of the points locally, the problem can be thought still as a two membrane problem or, or as an obstacle problem. Like I, like I, I give you an example, if you take a point, a blue point here, on the on the gamma on the on the gamma one uh, free boundary, and you take a small neighborhood around it, then in that small neighborhood, you the, the bottom membrane U three is completely separated from U one and U two. So therefore, locally in this blue in this blue circle, if we are in two D, where basically we see some membrane U3 that stays far from U1 and U2 and U1 and U2 just separate around the blue membrane. So locally still back at this particular point, we're still back to an obstacle problem. And you can do this at, at all the points except at the points where the two free boundaries intersect. So if I look at the point where gamma 1 and gamma 2 intersect, this means like, like at the orange ball and, and the, the orange point. Uh, no matter what small neighborhood you take, the three membranes are always there and are constantly interacting to each other. So, so in the in the triple membrane problem, really, or, or in in the end membrane problem, all the action happen happens in the at the places where more than, I mean, two two free boundaries or more than two intersect. Yeah, these are these are the regions that are new with respect to what, what we had before. Okay, so, sorry. So, uh, so now this will be the introduction for what, what it means, the end, member, the end membrane problem. And I would like to talk about some results about uh, regularity of, of solutions and the free boundary regularity in the three membrane problem. But of course, before I do that, I'll, I'll say what are the results in the classical obstacle problem, which we said is equivalent to the two membrane problem. And uh, yeah, what, yeah, what are the type of results that one is looking for? Yeah. So the obstacle problem, we, we try to write it in the simplest form in which you take your constant right hand side. So we think just Laplace of U is uh, the characteristic function of U being bigger than zero. So in the set where u is strictly positive, the Laplace of u is one. And, uh, and then of course th there is a coincidence region. The free boundary is the region where u is the boundary of the region where u is zero or the boundary of the region where u is positive. And in this picture is denoted by gamma. And on the free boundary, we know that u is zero, but at the same time, also the gradient of u has to be zero because the function has to be, if I, if I look at the solution to Laplace of u equal to a bounded right hand side, the solution has to be C1 alpha, therefore also the gradient has to vanish. Yeah? So, so the free boundary is special because you impose two conditions, u is zero and the gradient of u is zero. 
now in general for for the obstacle problem first i mean in, in such problems which are which are basic free boundary elliptic free boundary problems one looks for regularity of solution and after that regularity of the free boundary so concerning the regularity of solution like uh, stampakia showed the solutions are in w to p for any p i mean essentially he showed that the solution to the obstacle problem satisfy the the system on, on the top that the equation on the top and since the right hand side is uh, bounded from from uh, calderon sigmund theory you get that u is in w to p and Brazis and Kinderlader show that actually the, the U is as good as the right hand side, meaning that U is C11. It cannot be C2 because the Laplace of has a discontinuity. Yeah? And the op I mean, you, you get better regularity than, than classical Calderon Zygmunt theory because your solution has a sign. U is zero on U is always is zero on the free boundary on the coincidence set. On the other hand, on the other hand, when you separate, uh, you can only separate on one side of this, and and this is very powerful uh, information because I mean it, you can use ma maximum principle. So once. One, once obtain, I mean, once we have that U is C11, the next natural question would be how nice is the, is the curve gamma, how nice is the free boundary? And the usual, the I mean, the, the, the techniques here are similar to the one in the minimal surface theory. You, one would like to do a blow up uh, analysis. So if you pick up a point on the free boundary denoted here like x0 on gamma, it turns out that you, you can show without much difficulty that the function u has to separate quadratically uh, from, from such a free boundary point as you go in the positivity set. Yeah. And the quadratic scaling, so there is a natural scaling in this problem that leaves the problem invariant, which would be the quadratic scaling. Yeah? So this says that when you do this quadratic scaling, because of, because of the quadratic growth away from the free boundary, you end up with a global solution. So this blow up analysis was, uh, was done by Caffarelli. Um, and he showed that if you look at the blow up sequence, it has to, I mean, it has to converge to a global solution denoted here U bar. And there are only two possible blow up profiles in the obstacle problem. One is U bar has to be with equal to half a quadratic on, on half of the line, on the half, on the half play, uh, space and zero on the other half, half space. This is u bar is one half, let's say up to rotation, x one plus squared. And this is sort of the, the typical behavior that you'd expect uh, when you do blow up at the, at the free boundary point, you expect to, to end up with zero on one side of the free boundary and positive on the other side. On the other hand, there are also some other blow up points called singular points where, where the blow up instead is, is zero, but just on a subspace. Let's say if we're in 2D, zero on a line or just zero at a point and it's quadratic on both sides of the line. So this means that the coincidence set is very thin. The set where U is equal to zero is very thin at the point. Uh, it co it's, a, it's a line at least for the blow up solution. So Caffarelli in, in, in the original paper, he showed that if you end up with a blow up one, then actually the original solution U is uh, the, the free boundary is analytic. So it's very nice. Um, this has to do with uniqueness of blow ups. Initially, you just know that up to a subsequence, you, you end up with this profile, but Theoretically, it might be that on the different subsequence, you end up with a different profile and so on. On the other hand, once you prove uniqueness of blow up solutions, you, you show essentially that the free boundary has to be C1. And then uh, 
you, you can use, uh, you, you, you can bootstrap it and get analytic of, or analyticity of the free boundary. For the singular points, what you can say initially, you can only say that the, the free boundary is thin in the sense that it can be trapped between two planes that they, at the scale r, they are a small o of r far from each other initially. And then to prove uniqueness of these blobs it is a little bit more complicated. And uh, let's say to, to write here what, what are the results in the literature is that the free boundary in the obstacle problem can be split, as we said, into a regular part and a singular part. This has to do with the, with the type of blow up profile that you get at a point. The regular part is infinity. And it turns out that the singular part has to be included in a C1 submanifold. Um, I illustrate here by a picture in which you can have like regular points. I mean, most of the points are regular points, but sometimes you can have this cusp type uh, behavior like like at this point here, or maybe you can have the, the free bounder. I mean that the you might have some singular points uh, of this type in which the free boundary becomes thin, but u is positive on on both sides of of the of the thin line. So the regularity of uh, of the singular part is a little bit more complicated. But this, uh, there are several works. So I'd mentioned here uh, Caffarelli, Weiss, Monod, Sakai, and, and more recent works, Dr. Colombo, Spolaor, Belichkov, and Figali Serra, about finer property, regularity properties of, of the singular set. Why, why is the singular set more difficult than the regular part? So it's because the singular set is, is not stable under small perturbation. So if you think you have, you're, you're close to a parabola that vanishes on the line, then if you lower your boundary data just a bit, the singular line becomes, becomes thick and all the points from singular, they become regular points. Or if you lift the boundary data up, the singular set disappears. So the singular set is very unstable under small perturbation, and this makes the analysis uh, more difficult. And, and in all these works, uh, monotonicity formulas play uh, an important role. Okay, now, we're going to try to have some sort of so this is what happens in the in the obstacle problem like the types the types of results available for the obstacle problem and in the end membrane problem or the three membrane problem we'll, we'll try to have some sort of similar analysis um, so if we try to write the end membrane problem as a system, what, what you want to say is, that of course, U1 is bigger than U2 is bigger than UN. And when you look at the Laplace of UK, this depends on the regions of how many membranes uh, coincide with UK at the point where you're, where you're computing the Laplace. Yeah? So for example, if you're at the point where UK coincides with UI plus one, UI plus two, and so on, UJ, then the right hand side is to be given by the average of the right hand side. Yeah? So, so the way to write it would be in, in this formulation. So actually not, not too much was known about the end membrane problem. In the original paper, uh, Schippo and Vergara Caffarelli, they showed that the solutions are in uh, W2P for any P less than infinity, uh, which, which comes of course from, again, once you get this form, once you say that the var uh, variational problem is equivalent to this formulation, it follows right away. And also about the regularity of the free bound, there is, uh, there is a result to Lindgren and Rosani, who show that the free boundaries uh, are porous. So they cannot be dense uh, around any point on the free boundary, you can find the ball where u is uh, uk plus one separates quadratically from uk. So th this says that let's say they have uh, some small h n minus delta Hausdorff mesh. Uh, 
dimension. Okay, now, so with, uh, with Hui, we started looking at this problem a couple of years ago and we realized that actually one can get the optimal regularity just like, like in the regular obstacle problem, meaning that all the membranes should be of class C11, of course, provided that the right hand sides are uh, nice enough, let's say holder continuous. And uh, the observation is that when we look at two consecutive membranes, uh, they solve like an obstacle problem, but in which the right hand side is, uh, might be discontinuous, has almost no regularity. However, from a free boundary point, you can still show, even if, if, even if the right hand side is just bounded, you can still show that you can have at most quadratic separation between two consecutive membranes from, as you move away in, towards the set where they separate. So, so this is encoded in this inequality here, saying that two membranes, they, are, they can separate it most quadratically away from D here represents the distance to the free boundary, uh, to, to the K free boundary. So you get that any two consecutive membranes, they, they separate quadratic from the coincidence set. On the other hand, globally, you know that the sum of all the membranes solves an equation. Yeah, this is because again, you can perturb all the membranes by, by the same function at the same time. So just from this two information, you can, you can use some sort of induction uh, argument depending on the, how many membranes coincide at a point and so on, but one can, can show that actually solutions are, are uh, have optimal regularity C11. So after this, it, uh, the next step would be to look at the free boundary regularity and just to make things simpler, we, we just restrict to three boundaries. So I'm gonna assume here that we just have three boundaries, U1, U2, U3, constant right hand, constant forces, so let's say F1 equal to one, F2 zero, F3 negative one, which means that the top membrane is pushed down with constant force. The second membrane is free and the bottom membrane is pushed up with constant force. This sort of, uh, the fact that the forces are monotone is some sort of non-degeneracy condition that is uh, natural in, in obstacle problems. And also, because we know the Laplace of the sum, we can always subtract sort of the, the, the average from, from each function and you can, you can reduce it to the case that the sum of the three membranes is zero. So we're dealing with the three membrane problem, but you can always mod out a degree of freedom because you know the sum of the membrane, right? So, so in reality, you just have two unknowns because the sum is zero and two free boundary points, two, two, two free boundaries, gamma one and gamma two where, where, the, where the objects coincide. So we, we, we realized that actually vice monotonicity formula still holds in this vector valued version of, uh, of the obstacle problem and the vice monotonicity formula is essentially the energy uh, that we try to minimize rescale quadratically. And then you have to subtract a precise multiple of, of the L2 norm on the boundary of the ball of radius R, which also scales quadratically. And this is monotone in R. So this is vice monotonicity format that works for the obstacle problem, but works also in this setting. Of course, you vice monotonicity formula, you can only use it after you know optimal regularity because it's not clear that this, uh, mo this, this, uh, for this quantity is bounded below. It's not clear that is uh, non-negative, let's say. But after you know optimal regularity, you, say you, you prove that W is bounded below and then you can actually use the, the, the uh, power of the monotonicity formula. And the power of the monotonicity formula basically says that when you blow up, you end quadratically, you end up 
in a situation in which the, this quantity is constant and you, you end up with homogeneous of degree two blow ups. Yeah, so, so the consequence of the monotonicity formula is that when you, when you take a sequence tending to zero, so here I'm assuming that zero, let's say I'm assuming that zero is a free boundary point and the sum of the three membranes is equal to zero. This means that all the three membranes have to separate quadratically from zero. Using monotonicity formula, I end up that at a point, I, the blow up profile has to be homogeneous of degree two and I denote this blow up profile U1 bar, U2 bar, U3 bar, and this is a cone uh, a cone meaning that is homogeneous of degree two and solves the three membrane problem. Yeah. So then when you look for the free boundary, you try to say, of course, you first look in, in the 1D case and you try to say that roughly what happens in 1D happens also in higher dimension, maybe with the exception of some special points. So if you look in the 1D case and you look at the 1D cone, there are three profiles that have zero, a free boundary point for both uh, gamma one and gamma two. And this would be uh, a profile here denoted by one in which the coin, all, all three membranes coincide to the left, but then when you look to the positive X one axis, you have U one is uh, positive, U two is zero, U three is negative. There is another profile in which uh, the, the green membrane coincides with the red one when X1 is positive and then switches right away to the blue one when X, when X1 is negative. Yeah, so this is profile two. Sort of U1 uh, is free on the positive axis, but U2 and U2 you three coincide, the green and the red coincide to the right. And then on the negative axis, U3, the bottom one is free, but the green one switched to, to, to coincide to the top membrane. Yeah. And whenever they coincide, sort of the coefficient of the quadratic is changing. It becomes the average. Yeah. So here, the Laplace here would be one, while here the Laplace would be one half to the left. And here the Laplace would be negative one on U3 and here negative one. And there is a third profile, a third profile in which it, the, the three membranes are essentially separated except at the origin they all touch. So these are the only possible uh, profile in 1D. And then if you look at the energy of each of, each of the cone, one can compute that sort of the, the first profile has less energy than the second, which has less energy than the third profile. So, so, so these cones have energies and one, I mean, uh, the energy of the first is less than the one, the second is strictly less than the first. Okay, and then one wants to say, well, if I go in higher dimension, I can still uh, try to understand the profiles according to, to their blow up. And let's say some definitions here. If you go in higher dimension, we say that uh, zero, so, so our, uh, all the action, as I mentioned before, happens at intersection points of three boundaries. Yeah. So we look at intersection where, where sort of where the gamma one and gamma two coincide, we assume that they coincide at the origin. And we say that zero is a regular intersection point if there exists a blow up sequence that goes to the profile one after, after a rotation. Yeah. So I'm in higher dimension, but I'm assuming that the blow up profile is one dimensional and coincides with the profile one, which is shown here on the left. Yeah. So a regular intersection point would mean that the membranes would look like, like this. While if I want to look from above, means that the two free boundaries coincide and the coincidence set also coincide on, on one side of the, of the two membranes while on the other side, the, the three membranes completely separate. Yeah, so this would be a regular intersection point. And then we also define singular point uh, of type one, which means that 
when I look at the blow up profile again, it's one dimensional and coincides with the profile two from the 1D picture, which means that the membranes would look like the picture of the membranes would look like this, meaning that the green one switches on from one side, touches the, the red membrane, but on the other side, touches the blue one. And then again, gamma one would coincide with gamma two completely. If I, if I look from above at this picture, but the coincidence is the difference between uh, the regular uh, intersection point is that the coincidence sets are on separate sides, right? So, so in, in the singular, uh, in, in this case, in the singular uh, intersection of type one, uh, U1 equal to U2 is separated from U2 equal to U3. And a third singular intersection, which would be, we'd say singular intersection of type two is when uh, the U1, U2, and U3 in the blow up sequence, they are completely separated from each other. I mean, they, they are just quadratic polynomials. And they might coincide, but only on lines. Yeah. So, so one picture would be given here when the top membrane is given by blue, the middle one with green, and the bottom one with red. And they, you see, they all just touch at a single point. Yeah? This is more or less the prof, the version of the profile three from one D to two D. But in two D, you can still make the, the. I mean, just by playing with the coefficient, you can still make. Let's say that the blue parabola to touch the green parabola on a line, or maybe the red parabola to touch the green parabola on another line. So, so somehow this, this example, the coincidence sets, they are either points or lines, but they have empty interiors. Yeah? So if you want to look, I mean, like, like uh, the, the the inter gamma one and gamma two around the origin could just be the point zero, like which would correspond to the picture that I have on the, on the left. Or it might be that gamma two is a line and gamma one is just a point or gamma one is a line and gamma two are a line that intersect at the origin, but they don't have uh, any interiors. Okay, so, uh, Okay, so all this we, we knew uh, once, once we got the optimal regularity, we knew all this, and then we tried to study cones in R2 or in, in higher dimensions. Yeah? It's much more difficult to, I mean, in R2, one can still find, I mean, uh, in, in R2, the problem reduces to, because the cones are homogeneous, reduces to a 1D problem on the circle that can be analyzed. And it turns out in R2, these profiles, regular intersection, singular one and singular two, these are all possible uh, intersection points. There are no other profiles. And uh, on the other hand, we don't know how to do this in higher dimensions. Yeah? So in higher dimension, we don't know if there are some other possible uh, profile. Um, okay. However, it's still interesting because what, what this intersection point suggests, they just suggest that every time uh, the coincidence set have non-empty interiors, the free boundaries have to intersect tangential. Yeah? I mean, if I look at singular one and singular two, the two free boundaries coincide. Uh, this is, of course, in the blow up picture, but in the original picture, this should tell us that the, the two free boundaries always when they intersect and, and, and they have some thickness, they have to intersect uh, um, tangentially. So here on, on the right, for example, is just like some sort of picture of uh, how the coincidence sets could look the blue one would be the coincidence between the top membrane and uh, U1 and U2, the red one between U2 and U3. And every time that they cross, they have to cross tangentially. So for example, if I look at the point A here, this would be a regular intersection point because the coincidence sets fall on the same line on the free boundaries. Yeah, the same would happen at the point B and the point C. On the other hand, if I pay attention to the point D here, 
this would be a singular intersection point of type one because the three boundaries are tangent, but the coincidence sets are on opposite sides of this tangent line. Yeah? And here, like the point E would be like a singular point of type two in which when I blow up, uh, the coincidence sets become thinner and thinner. And what I would see in the end, I would see some sort of intersection of two lines for, of, of the free boundaries. Yeah? So, um, however, the fact that the, the free boundaries intersect tangentially is not, uh, uh, I mean, it's a bit, uh, I mean, it, it's something interesting because our problem has two degrees of freedom, right? I mean, one is more doubt because we take that the sum of the three membranes is zero, but, but we have sort of, we can choose arbitrarily the boundary data of the membrane on top and on the bottom. So our problem has a two, degree, uh, two degrees of freedom. On the other hand, the free boundaries, every time they meet, they have to meet tangentially. So something happens at an intersection point. Yeah? So just to give an example, like if, if, you, if you try to think that we are in a, if we are in this situation here, in which our uh, solutions are given by quadratic polynomials, and they just agree the top and the middle one agree on the blue line, and the middle one and the bottom one agree on the red line. If you just push them a little bit more towards each other, the top membrane and the bottom membrane, the, the, blue line has to become thick and the red line has to become thick. And it seems that they will have to intersect transversely. But the picture would be depicted here on the right when, when you push them a little bit more down is that indeed they, they will have to follow like this, but just when they intersect, the free boundaries have to readjust so that they become tangential to each other. Of course, all this is just based on intuition. One still has to prove these results rigorously meaning that you have to prove uniqueness of blow up profile in order to, to be able to, to say that this picture actually happens and, 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 uh, and they are not much more complicated that things can rotate slowly. So this is exactly what we managed to do more recently. And the theorem would be that if I look at the regular intersection point then actually gamma one and gamma two, they both have to be C1 log surfaces near such an intersection point and they have to intersect tangentially. And what is interesting is that the C1 log regularity is optimal. Actually, this is what happens generically. So generically when two free boundaries intersect, they have to readjust in a C1 log fashion when they cross each other. And another theorem is about singular, the singular uh, points of type one, they, uh, they can be included in, a, I mean, in, they are part of a C1 alpha submanifold locally and the singular points of type two, they are part of a C1 submanifold locally. So this is very similar to the obstacle problem when it comes to the singular set. This, uh, this uh, one about singular one is some, somehow intermediate between regular intersection point and singular points. And also what we, what we show is generically that the singular intersections of gamma one, I mean that, that, that these uh, singular uh, points of type one are unstable. So just to depict the picture on the right here, if you think you start with two free boundaries that the coincidence sets, I mean, they are tangent, they coincide by the coincidence sets are one on one side and one on the other side. If you perturb them, the free boundaries, they change and they try to make intersection of type one, regular intersection points. Yeah? So, so they, they turn quite a lot around under small perturbation in order to, to intersect, to have regular intersection points. Yeah? So uh, let's say some open problems. Th th these theorems, they are true in any dimension. The, the only thing that uh, we, we, we cannot classify in any dimension would be the cones. We don't know that the cones mentioned in, uh, in the definition of regular points and singular points of type one and two, if these are all possible blow ups. 
Also, let's say a much simpler question in some sense, we even cannot say in general dimension that the regular intersection point have the least, the cones have the least energy. And the situation here is much more complicated because you cannot do a dimension reduction as in the classical sense. It might be that you have cones in, in dimension seven, so let's say presumably, that they just have an, that the gamma one and gamma two just intersect at the origin, but they have no other intersection points. So when you look at the monotonicity formula, you cannot pass the information from dimension seven to dimension six because you cannot blow up along any line where the, where the free boundaries would intersect. So somehow the fact that we are dealing with the intersection of two free boundaries and, and these points can just be isolated where they can be everywhere makes the problem more difficult. Yeah? So, so we cannot, uh, I mean, we believe that one is the least energy solution among all such cones, but we cannot, uh, we don't know how to do it. So I see my, my time is up. So I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you.